you heard a lot about sort of different discovery techniques in the last couple of hours from different lawyers, but I'd like to kind of bring it together, wrap it up a little bit, and um, thematically explain a bit how discovery works uniquely in the fair housing context or the discrimination context and what you're actually trying to find out in a case. And I think this may be useful for particularly for investigators, both for attorneys if you haven't done one of these cases and are thinking about doing it, right, it's really helpful because when you get a case, you want to quickly know, do I have a good case and what should I be looking for? And uh, for the folks who um, are investigators, so um, David and HUD and um, Tiana, you do investigation and um, I don't know if Angalo is still here um, uh, who does investigation, but all of you who are working on these cases, I think it's helpful to know. So I, I want to first talk about the theories of discrimination and how that brings together some of the things you've been hearing about the discovery techniques. And then, after we talk about that for a few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about settlement and how I actually go about evaluating a case. What's the technique I use to figure out how much is a case worth and what should my opening offer be and what would be a reasonable settlement and how do we get to numbers that make these cases meaningful to bring if you're a, if you're a, 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 a fair housing lawyer. Okay, so I've talked this morning about how there are two ways to prove liability. One we call disparate treatment which requires a showing of intent. And the other is disparate impact, where we look at results or the effect of a neutral rule or policy. And in the intent case, which I want to focus on first, because most cases fall in the category of an intent case, the key thing is trying to figure out, you want to get a, what I call a window on the mind of the decision maker. That's the key. That's really what the case is about. Because what you're trying to show when you say this case is an intent case is what you're trying to establish is that whatever the adverse action that was taken against your client. So in the housing, it's you didn't get the apartment. You didn't, weren't able to buy the house. Um, so Jack, in, in the case of employment, I keep coming back to you as the employment person, but employment would be you didn't get the job, but it's the adverse action. You need to show that the decision maker ha did it because of the person's race, national origin, disability, whatever, right? That it seems so obvious, but we've got to come back to basics on it because, believe it or not, in a lot of discrimination cases, people sort of Keep, take their eye off the ball. They forget that's the goal of the thing and then they get off into, 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 into side roads of discovery that take you to places that are not, not useful or helpful. So trying to figure out what, establish what was the decision maker thinking, what was in that person's head because that's what intent is really about. Okay, there are two ways to prove intent. One way is what I call the smoking gun evidence or direct evidence of discrimination. That's a lot of when we were telling war stories up here, that's a lot of what you heard, right? When I told you about Beth Jacobson, one could argue, well, she's flipping for Wells Fargo, so she's saying, this is what we did. And we were told to do it, target African American zip codes, go to black churches, we knew what we were doing, okay? Or in RSHT, where we found ex-employees who say this, what, what happens. Um, Chewy was talking about cases that he's had where, you know, someone said, this is the reason I did it, or you put someone on the stand and that's why, they, um, why, why it happened. John Obi was talking about also about cases he had where it comes out where people say, okay, this is why I did it. But believe it or not, those are the cases we all like to talk about because they're great endings and they're fun, but most of the time you start off in a case with evidence that is what is the second category which is circumstantial evidence. Now there's a lot, a lot of case law in the discrimination area that says you can use circumstantial evidence to infer intent. You don't have to have a smoking gun because the notion is that discrimination is not something that is always obvious. People don't always talk about it, right? So you've got you to build your case usually through circumstantial evidence. 
One aside, I will say that the direct evidence during the course of a case pops up more often than you would think if you do your investigation well. But you can't count on it. So I always think I got to build my case through circumstantial evidence. And that's really what Steve was talking about with his discovery. He was saying if you can show that the reasons that are given for African Americans, for example, don't apply to whites, that's what we're going to talk about a bit is circumstantial evidence, okay? Are you everybody with me there on that distinction? So basically, what I, I group this for ease of thinking about both discovery and grouping together types of evidence that I'm going to ask for, whether it's through John's interrogatories or Chewy's or Steve's, I think about it in three categories. One is historical evidence. That is, if it's a housing complex, I want to know, have they been sued before? Have they ever been under a consent decree? What's happened, essentially, in the past with this building? If it was, if it's a families with children case, I, for example, might want to know before the 88 amendments, did they have a no children rule, right? You know, something like that. The second type of evidence is statistical. So it's well established in discrimination cases that you can rely on statistics. How do statistics work? It, for people who didn't take a statistics class in college, which I did not, do not have a graduate degree in statistics, which I do not, which knew nothing about statistics, which I did, knew nothing about statistics until I started this area. It's pretty simple, and you can learn it pretty easily. It goes basically like this. If you have a certain pool of people applying for a building who are qualified in an applicant pool or applying for a job, if there's no thumb on the scale, one would expect that if they're all in a qualified pool, that the outcome of who gets into the building, percentage-wise, is going to roughly mirror the applicant pool, whether that's for jobs or whether it's for housing, right? So if my applicant pool is 10% African American, and the requirement is that, OK, you've got to make a certain minimum amount of money, you've got to have a certain FICO score, and, uh, or you know, credit score, maybe there's no credit score, um, and uh, you know, you're employed. Um, if I look at the pool of people and I see it's 10% African American and 90% white, right, I'm going to figure that the outcome of who gets into that building should be roughly 10% African American, 90% white. Let's do it the other way. Let's say it's 50% African American in the pool and 50% white. I'm going to expect the outcome is going to be 50 50. If the outcome, even after I've controlled for the basic qualifications. And on a job, it might just be, OK, you've got a driver's license and a high school or high school equivalent you know, degree. Take that pool of people. And let's say the outcome is it's 10% of the pool turns out to be African American and 90% turns out to be white. Statisticians, you turn over to a statistician based on very easy calculation they do based on sample size and other things, can say, that the likelihood of that outcome resulting from chance, from chance alone, that difference between what you'd expect and what you get, they can say, we can rule that likelihood of it being due to chance, we can rule it out by a degree of statistical certainty that they have ways of saying um, uh, uh, that are, is very powerful. And statisticians work in this world. So, if it is more than a certain number of what they call standard deviations off of what you would expect, statisticians will look and say if it's more than two or three or four standard deviations, they will look at you and say the likelihood of that outcoming occurring by chance is one in 10,000 or one in 100,000. Or if the deviations are high enough, one in a million of that happening. Now, you've got to be careful. That doesn't prove it's discrimination. It just means you can rule out chance. This isn't just a random event. And what it does mean is there's a thumb on the scale somewhere. Something's happening more than likely that's driving that result. And what the statistician can say when you put the statistician on the stand is not this proves discrimination, but the statistician can say this is consistent with a theory of discrimination. Think of it as if you're trying to um, put evidence on a scale where you're going to move the scale more than 51% in your favor, 
of circumstantial evidence, that would be one nice piece of package of, of evidence you put on the scale and it tips it a little bit more in your favor. You've ruled out chance, right? It also can be useful to defend from a landlord who says to you, which you'll get, you're accusing me of discrimination? Well, out of 100 people in this building, 10 of them are African American. If I were a racist, I would have no African Americans, right? So what do you say to that? You say, well, let's look at your applicant pool. Your applicant pool is 50% African American, and now my statistician is going to say that the likelihood of your getting to 10% instead of 50% African American in the building is one out of 10,000, or one out of 100,000 by chance alone. That suggests you're doing something with this pool of people to get this outcome. It's very, very helpful. Doesn't prove discrimination, but it's helpful. So statistics have always been important in discrimination cases, starting in the employment area and moving to housing. And you should not shy away from them. You should, as you investigate, that's part of your looking at the building. How many people, for example, what's the breakdown in the building, roughly? And then you can get a, you can get a general gist of what you think the applicant pool would be. You know the demographics of the area you're in. If you practice in your, in your local community, you know who's likely going to be applying. And you can tell if something's off, right? You know if something's done feel right there. There's an outcome that doesn't make sense. Anecdotal evidence. This is evidence where um, people may tell you as you go along in discovery, um, I, um, you know, uh, a similar thing happened to me. Or I heard so and so tell a, um, a, a, a very improper racial joke. Or there was another incident where someone was treated hostily or rudely who's African American. Um, who's going to talk about that? Um, I sometimes put ex employee testimony in that category of what I call anecdotal evidence. Other incidents. It's not happening to your client but it's happening to other people and again suggest a consistency of behavior that would be one more piece of evidence that goes on that scale that tilts it more towards 51 percent from which a jury could infer intent. The last category is comparative evidence and that's the most important and that's really what Steve was talking about in a more granular way and what Steve is so good at and what has allowed him to build his practice doing very effective, in particular, fair lending cases. Because what Steve was actually saying is he's exploring, he's understanding whether similarly situated individuals who are not in the protected group are treated differently. And that is the key to really to a discrimination case. Um, testing evidence also looks at comparative evidence. And think about it. It, it. it makes sense. I want to pull you back out of the weeds for a second and think about discrimination generally. You know, I remember I have three grown daughters now um, who are all uh, out of the house and um, two are done with college and they're working and everything. But, um, you know, when they were little, I remember so clearly uh, those, those uh, you know, uh, situations you'd have with little kids where um, you... Your, your oldest child gets two Oreo cookies. And the little one who's, you know, three years younger says, I want a second Oreo cookie. But you know it's, it's not, they shouldn't have a second Oreo cookie. They're going to get sick. So they're pretty smart, even a two or three year old. And they look at their oldest sister and, they, and what do they say? They say, she got two. And I only got one. And what makes me different from her, basically? Why are you treating me differently? Right? You're discriminating, basically. That concept of discrimination is something that's really sort of basic. And that's really what you're doing here. And that's what Steve is testing out. When Steve gets the reasons why the African American, his African American client is turned down for a loan, he's testing it out to see, OK, the other person got two Oreo cookies. His client got none. So the question is, why? Are other people who are just like his client but happen to be a different race, did they also get two Oreo cookies, okay, or similar benefit or whatever it may be, okay? So, so that's, that, that's 
th th that's the basic concept. And in the law, the way it plays out, it actually has a formal structure in the law. I've given you a concept, but the Supreme Court has laid it out and talked about it in this way. They said, there's a prima facie case that first a plaintiff has to establish. The idea is you're a member, this is any discrimination case, you're a member of a protected class, you applied for whatever it was, you met the minimum qualifications, you were rejected, and typically the housing remained available or went to someone who's not a member of, a protect, of the protected class. Because if it went to someone who was in the protected class, it would undermine the notion that there was discrimination going on. Then, if you establish that, the, it's the defendant's burden in an intent case to come forward with a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. The burden doesn't shift the defendant of proof, but the burden of coming forward with evidence shifts. This is a very easy burden to meet. The legitimate non-discriminatory reason can be absolutely anything. It can be, you know, um, you uh, were hostile when you met me, you yelled, I thought you wouldn't be a good tenant, you, I have a job requirement, I have a FICO score requirement, I have a minimum income requirement. It can be almost anything um, to meet that burden of coming forward evidence. And then we get to the third stage. The third stage is the stage of a case, of a housing case, employment discrimination case, and this is you've got to prove pretext. You have to prove that the reason given is a lie. And it's not, that just means, pretext means it's not the true reason. You don't have to prove it's discrimination. Like, you don't have to come up with a smoking gun. But if you prove that the reason is not true, the Supreme Court has said from that you can infer, the jury is allowed to infer discrimination. So the name of the game is proving what Steve does. That when he gets into that file and shows that you say it's you didn't have you know, the amount of savings, you didn't have, the house wasn't worth enough money. And you then go to the white comparators and you say, but those people didn't have it either, and they got it. You've essentially proved that the reason they're giving is a lie, it's not the true reason, it's pretext. And from that, Steve can then argue to the jury, you're allowed to infer. The instruction actually goes from the judge under the relevant Supreme Court case, you are permitted to infer discrimination as the reason if you find that the reason given by the defendant is not the true reason. That's actually in a jury instruction that you can get approved by the Supreme Court, and you should have it in your case. So what does that mean for discovery? So what Steve and John have really all been, and Chewy have really all been saying is, when you do your interrogatories, when you do your uh, depositions, when you ask for your documents, that really is the purpose of the circum circumstantial evidence, is to establish this, the pretext. Now the question becomes, how do you do it? And there are a couple of simple rules that, I mean, I've been doing this for years, for you know, nearly 30 years now, but I, I keep going back in a case, even a complicated lending case, I keep going back to the same basic bedrock principles, and when it gets confusing, I literally go back and say, have I done this? I think, nope, I haven't done it yet, I gotta do it. First step is, I have to identify the legitimate non-discriminatory reason that the defendant is asserting. Because defendants can come up through the course of a case with a lot of reasons, but remember, my job is gonna be to prove that the reason or reasons they're giving is a lie. If I don't know for sure, even at the moment of trial, what exactly is the reason they're asserting, or if I leave the door open such that they could come up with a new reason even on the eve of trial, I'm dead. Because I won't have the evidence I need to show the jury that the excuse they're giving, they didn't use with a white person, or they didn't use with a non-Hispanic white person, or they didn't use with a person who didn't have a disability. And for investigators, and when you train your investigators, this, I think, is the key thing. And this is what I think when I see HUD complaints or HUD investigations, when I see an investigation that I think has missed the mark, it's because the investigator hasn't focused first and foremost on getting from the defendant what is the reason you say that this happened and then testing that out, running down every lead to test, to test that out. 
So the first thing I do is identify it, and then I lock it in. And locking in, for me, and every lawyer does it differently. So you heard Steve doesn't like interrogatories. That's a really interesting perspective. It is true what Steve said, that if you ask for in certain interrogatories before depositions, defendants are prepared. Um, but my, in my experience, um, defendants are going to be prepared regardless. I, what I do is, in the initial interview with a client when I'm learning about the case, I ask them, do you have any document or did anybody in your dealings with the company tell you the reason why you got turned down? What did they say? You'd be amazed the number of times that um, one forgets to ask that question. You hear about all the bad stuff that happened, but you don't ask the question, did they say to you why you weren't getting it? Or you may ask them. Sometimes I say, if, if they aren't really forthcoming about it, I say, if, you, if, I, if I were sitting here right now and talking to the owner of the company or talking to the landlord, what would he or she say about why you didn't get this? I know it would be a lie, but what, just what would it be? What do you think it would be? Boom, right away it comes out. Well, they'll tell you that it was because, you know, I did X, and then something new comes out that you didn't know, all right? So I always ask in the initial interview. Then I look for, in the answer to the complaint, sometimes if an answer is just not a boilerplate deny, sometimes you'll get an affirmative statement by a defendant about why uh, the, the, the housing was denied. I will then, I will put it in, inter in, in interrogatories because I just want to hear them say it. So I will say, if you contend that discrimination was not the reason why so-and-so uh, didn't get the housing, state each and every reason why it happened. Because I, wa I know they're going to have an explanation, and I want to hear their story first so I can line it up. And they'll give three or four reasons. Maybe it's one. Then I will make sure that before I start my depositions, I have a 30B6 deposition so that I can find out who would be the decision maker who would be in charge of determining two things. One is, who would be the decision maker to make the decision on my person so I've got the right, so I can depose the right decision maker? Because you can call a lot of people for deposition, you find out they're the wrong person. I didn't make the final decision, it went up to so and so, you know? I don't want to waste time. I want to get to the ultimate decision maker. The other thing I want to know is I want to know where are the documents located that would tell me the answer to, to this question. If you keep files, where are they? I can learn that in a 30B6. And then I take the deposition. And when I take the deposition of the decision maker or, or decision makers, um, I make sure that my transcript shows that I've been merciless in continuing to question until I got finality on the answer. You've told me this was the reason. Credit score was the problem. Is there any other reason? Well, yes, I think his income wasn't sufficient. What about the income was not sufficient? Right, da, da, da. Other than the income and the credit score, is there anything else that is a reason why you didn't take my client? Right? And until the person says, no, there's no other reason, or no, I can't think of anything else at this time, I keep going. Now, if they say, I can't think of anything else at this time, which happens a lot, I say to them, I understand. If you think of anything else between now and the time of trial, I would ask you to let your, tell your lawyer and have your lawyer let me know. Will you do that? You know, objection, don't talk to my client, I'm always going to do all tell them. Will you do that? Usually the witness goes, yes, of course I will. You know. So you get that on the record. And that way, you protected yourself from getting spun at trial. Because if you get spun at trial and a new reason comes up, you pull out the deposition transcript and you impeach the witness, right? And the jury knows exactly, usually, what's going on. It wasn't brought up at the time. It's being made up now. That's how, that's how we how I think about getting to the pretext. Um, Steve's already talked about it, so I won't go into it, but um, you know, there's a couple of cases. Um, one I'll just mention that really dramatizes, I think, at kind of a high level, the importance of comparative evidence. This Boyer case, this is a case I had back in the 90s. Spencer Boyer was a professor of law at Howard University, African-American. 
he went to, again, it was like Steve, it was, it was, it was a lending case. He, he went, to, um, went to get a loan from First Virginia Bank. And when he walked in, the person he dealt with was a guy named Mr. Grippo, who was white. And Spencer Boyer was the most senior professor of law at Howard. He was about 62, 63 years old, um, very distinguished looking. He came in, um, trying to describe him, salt and pepper hair. But on the day that he came in for loan, it was a Saturday morning. The bank branch was open. He walked in. Um, and he met Mr. Grippo. He was in jeans. He, Spencer Boy, was in jeans and a pullover. And um, so Mr. Grippo looked at him and said, I, you know, I want to find out about applying for a home equity loan, like a $50,000 home equity loan. His daughter was going to stand for law school. It was going to be starting. And he, he was a tax professor, and he wanted to get the tax write off of taking out the loan. He had about $400,000 of equity in his home. And uh, he made about $85,000 a year. He was a tenured professor. So this is pillar of the community is not, is not someone who is a, you know, a credit risk. Um, and he said, Mr. Grippo looked at him and gave him a look that he said, if you're African American, you live in America, you grow up in America, you know, sometimes you get a look and you just know, I'm not going to get this. He said, I just knew I wasn't going to get this. It was just not going to happen. Um, but he put in his application and sure enough, a month later, he gets a rejection back, and he can't understand why he gets the rejection. And listed on the form was um, inadequate credit. So he knew he didn't have inadequate credit, uh, that, his, that his credit score was good. So he filed a complaint with the Maryland Human Relations Commission, and that forced the bank to give an answer. So he walked into my office and he showed me the letter, the answer that he got to the complaint from the bank. And the bank said, you have eight 30-day late payments on your credit cards. That was the reason why it got turned down. Eight 30-day late payments. So I looked at Professor Boyer and I said, Professor Boyer, said, he said, do, do I have a case? Told me the whole thing and said, do I have a case? And I said, why did you have these late payments? What happened? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. He said, I paid them. It was like credit cards, you know. I must have paid on the 31st day. Maybe we were away on vacation. There was a little bit of interest that we paid. It's not like we didn't pay. I thought my wife was going to pay it. This is over the last 11 years this happened, right? So, but, and, and so he said, do I have a case? And I said, what did I say? What did I say? You guys can, you guys can figure this out. I don't know. I don't know. But what did I say I needed to find out? I said, look, either this is an equal opportunity, really stupid lender, right? Mm -hmm. They turn down people who have eight 30-day late payments with credit history like yours over the last 11 years, and they do that to both whites and African Americans and everybody, and then they're just equal opportunity stupid, because why would you turn someone like you down? Or you got a case, depending upon what we find in the files. <coughs> but I knew that something was wrong here. I mean, that to me was not a reason. I had done enough bank work to know that that just didn't make any sense to me. That was so minor in the broader scheme of things. So, and I could see his credit score and all the rest. So the battle was going to be over the files because we had, as Steve said, we had to get into the files. We teed up the motions, a big battle. They said, you're not entitled to it. Privacy, too burdensome. Be overwhelming for us to have produced this stuff. We can't do it. We fought. That, the whole case really turned on that. We got into the files, and they turned them over. And they were under a protective order. And it was what we found was basically a treasure trove. What we found was that there were folks who had um, 60, 70, 80 late payments over time, had gotten loans from Mr. Grippo within the last two-year period that we were allow allowed to look. Better, I was able to call people because the names and the telephone numbers were on there. So Sunday night, I call people. Sunday evening is the best time to call, particularly if it's like NFL Sunday. Everybody's home about 6 o'clock. You call. You either get people really pissed off. I've had people say, don't call me on NFL Sunday. You know? But you get people, they're home. I call them. I said, hi, my name's John Realm, and I work for a civil rights organization. We're investigating First Virginia Bank. I understand you've got a loan from First Virginia Bank. I wanted to find out a little bit of how your experience is. I'm interested to know, was it good or was it bad? Either way is fine. I'm just trying to find out information. They go, oh, I'm really, it was great. 
I was really great. There was no problem. Everything went through so smoothly. Did you deal with a Mr. Grippo? Yeah, Mr. Grippo, really nice guy. I see here in your file you had some late payments. Was that a problem? Not a problem at all. Mr. Grippo told me what to write to explain the late payments. So I just sent in the letter. Really? Right? It was simple. And then everything went through. So we found the letters. The letters were things like, literally, letters in the file. Dear Mr. Grippo, I'm writing to explain why I was late. I was late because I got behind on my credit obligations. Sincerely, John Smith. Gets the loan. Literally. I'm, I am describing what was in the case. And, and when we laid this out, every single one of these people was white. Right? No one who was African American, and I'm not, not saying you have to have the zero, but we had the zero, was given any benefit by Mr. Grippo. And when we found that, and then when we laid it out, we had 24 examples of this. Um, we laid it out. The case settled for 250, roughly $250,000 on a $50,000 home equity loan. So his daughter kind of went through Stanford Law School pretty, pretty, in pretty good shape, right? Room and board. Room and board. <laughs> but do you see what I'm getting at? It really all turned on finding similarly situated people who just got treated differently. And that's really what Steve is doing. And, and in his, in his cases, and John's doing it in his cases, for certain types of evidence, Chewy's doing his case cases, and every case is a variant of that. The knife hammer case, just real quick, it was, so this, so Bill Knife Hammer was HIV positive, uh, gay. He, um, uh, he had contracted AIDS from his partner. Um, he had, um, in order, his partner, died from AIDS. In order to try and save his partner who had no insurance, he ran up his credit card bills and, and basically charged them off, just maxed them out to try and cover the medications. His partner died. Five years passes. He's living with HIV, still doing well at the time of the case. Um, and he applies for what is a perfect apartment in a townhouse on Colorado Avenue in, 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 in Northwest DC. And he walks in and he tells the company, which was the Brenneman Property Management Company, was managing the, the house the property, right up front, he says, look, you're going to see on my credit that I had charged off a bunch of credit cards. I'm telling you right now, it's because it was five years ago, I ran up these bills, try and save my partner who had AIDS um, and died. Um, but it's been five years. I've rehabilitated my credit. You can check the following references for the last five years. I'm fully employed. You know, this is what happened. Turned down. Just turned down flat 30 days later. So he, he, his apartment's really perfect because he's going he's gonna to work out of the apartment. It's really what he wants. So he goes back and he says, look, I, I don't know why I got turned down, but I will give you um, two times the rental deposit and um, I will give you a guarantor on, 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 on the lease for, you know, so you have someone who, it's gonna, it was gonna be his minister from the Unitarian Church who administered to him and his partner while they were sick, while he was, while his partner was sick, and she was going to guarantee the full year's lease personally on this. Turned out. He goes back a final time and says, I will pay the entire $11,000 of the rent, first year's rent, in one lump sum check. Turned down. Comes to me with a case. So, of course, I took the case, and we filed, and the explanation was as follows. It's against the law, they said, to take a um, more than one month's rent as a deposit under DC law. Wrong. Um, we have never taken a year's lease, uh, uh, and we would never do it because it's dangerous because at the end of the year, we wouldn't know if, he, if the person would pay again. That's a perverse logic. And we don't take guarantors as a matter of policy. So I said, fine, let's get into the files and see what you actually do. Because you knew this person had a dis was a person with disability. Um, so we had, we had a terrific um, judge on the case in DC. Um, who, when we teed up the motion to compel, because just like Boyer, they fought it, she actually wrote a terrific opinion. If you 
if you Google or do a Westlaw search on the knife hammer case, you'll find the decision. It's laid out, and she puts it right out there and says, in a discrimination case, circumstantial evidence is critical, comparative evidence is critical. If the plaintiffs don't have access to these files to test out these reasons, then they can't prove their case. You get into the files. We got into the files. Predictable, same thing happened as in Boyer. We found people that they had used guarantors for. We found people who had paid double the, the uh, down payment. And we found people who they actually had offered. There was evidence that they, people had offered uh, that um, uh, they had considered people who, who would be willing to pay up to a year's rent in advance. So um, that case also settled for several hundred thousand dollars. Um, you get the picture. It's, it's, I'm just driving this home about this comparative evidence. It's just really critical. Testing evidence is the same thing. Testing evidence, if you think about it conceptually, is exactly the same thing, only it's being scientifically created. Instead of looking for comparative people in a file, you're actually just saying, we'll set it up like that, right? We're just setting it up. OK. Um, let's jump ahead. So I think that sort of hopefully brings together a little bit of the um, discovery we talked about. Let's talk about first a little bit about remedies um, and, and damages, and then how do I evaluate a case, and then, and then, then we'll call it a day, because we've been going on for a long time. So on the compensatory side, under the Fair Housing Act, you can get out-of-pocket costs and expenses. The, co the difference in a cost of housing, you can get, for example, moving and storage costs, job-related costs, transportation. Um, if you had counseling because of the discrimination, medical, uh, costs, you can get that. It's just like an employment discrimination case. The big money on the compensatory damages is the intangible compensatory damages, which is humiliation, embarrassment, and emotional distress. And this is simply based on the testimony of the plaintiff, nothing more. You can have scientific evidence if you want, but you don't have to. You don't have to have a doctor. Just you can have your client take the stand and say, this is what it did to me, and this is how it made me feel. What's very powerful is to have friends or family testify about how it changed the person, what the person was like before, what this did to them afterwards, stuff that makes sense and is practical, um, what it caused them, uh, how, it, how it, made it made a change in, in their life. Um, these damages now, HUD has you know, had some rulings in the Benai case and others where they've awarded up to $75,000 per person for this type of damage. I would say juries, depending upon what kind of jury you get, jury could award $5,000, a jury could award up, award up to $100,000 to an individual plaintiff for compensatory damages. And you can find a full range of these decisions. Um, Westlaw has published a Fair Housing Manual that I, I've done for many, many years, and we supplement each year. And we have a lot of decisions in that manual, the practice manual, that has a whole range of these decisions. So you can find lots of support. The main thing, guys, is you just got to know your juries. I mean, I can preach this to people, but look, I'll, I've been done these trainings in places where people say, hey, don't, you know, we know our juries here. We're not going to get that kind of money. I say, okay, fair enough. But there is know where you are because there is good precedent, and juries. Um, can be moved on it. For punitive damages, there's no cap, as I said, in 1988. And the purpose is not to compensate, but to punish and deter. That's really important. So what is a proper <coughs> punitive damage amount for General Motors to deter them is different than what it would be for mom and pop landlord. I always try and get the financial information of a defendant if I can, because that's going to be helpful, particularly if it's a bank. Um, I have not included the cost of injunctive relief, but injunctive relief can include asking for the, the landlord or the owner to, to go through fair housing training, to engage in record keeping, um, reporting, monitoring, affirmative advertising, and so forth. So these can be costs that, again, go to it. So here's what I do when I evaluate a case. And I have a pretty simple scenario, but this more or less dictates my demand letter. And you know, young associates come to me and say, um, OK, you know, you've assigned me this case, John, and um, we just got contacted by the owner. Um, they would like to settle. It's early on in the case they'd like to settle. They want a number from us. What do we do? How do we do it? So the way I think about it is I start with what I call the defendant's worst case exposure. I think of it as if everything in this case were to go right for me, 
and wrong for you. Imagine that baseball game where, you know, the Tigers take the field and every single pitch they hit out of the park, right? It's like the dream game. What is the worst case exposure for the visiting Red Sox who face the Tigers on a roll with a pitcher who can do no wrong? You guys had a great pitching staff last year. Do you still have a great pitching staff this year? We do. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> is, is, the bu is the bullpen better this year? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm to the, I, I, the, the, the question. <laughs> and, and you know, we may not even get there because the Red Sox aren't looking so good so far this year. But anyhow, okay. So imagine I think of it as the perfect game. All right. So what would it be? In a typical case, I would say, okay, out of pockets might be twenty-five thousand if I win. Um, the compensatory damages, let's say, it's seventy for the jury award, seventy-five thousand to my one client. The punitives, let's say that the company, you know, makes, I don't know, it's profitable, they make a couple million dollars a year. I can make an argument that it's going to take 400,000 in punitives to deter this company, all right? I look, I, I predict what the financials are going to be. My fees, I say, so our DC rates are high, but if I'm going to try a case all the way through with our firm, $400,000 would be a pretty standard amount of fees that we would have to take a standard garden variety case all from the beginning all the way through trial. Here, maybe the rates would be lower, maybe be a little bit less, but it's going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars if you're going to try a case all the way through from beginning to end. Their fees are going to be to try the case, defend the case. I'm always going to say it takes me a little bit more time to prove the case than for them to defend it, but you better believe that the defense firm is going to charge $300,000 to take a case through trial. No sweat. Easy. That's easy. That's why they're doing it. So I would say, OK, your total exposure, when I add all that up, if everything goes right for me and wrong for you, you're looking at $1.2 million that you will end up paying. That's, that, that's your worst case nightmare. And then what I say is, OK, I think that the litigation risk of the case. I'm bringing this case because I think the facts are really strong. So I'll give it a 20% litigation risk against me. I'll say I think it's 80% likely I'm going to win. So I'll discount you right off the bat $240,000 of that $1.2 million. Because I'm just saying 20% chance I could lose. So I'll discount it by $240,000. So I'm now saying a conservative evaluation of the worth of the case to me is $960,000. I then say to the defendant, I'm going to cut you a break. My opening, my opening demand, 800000 which is already just basically two-thirds of the worst case exposure, right? And then most settlement negotiations, I've been doing this a long time, but every single, whether, whether it's Wells Fargo and, you know, scores of millions of dollars or whether it's, you know, the mom and pop that's fighting over $10,000, it comes down to the exact same thing every single time. If I start at 800, the middle they're at zero. The middle ground is 400, and the mentality is: if we get below 400, we win. If we pay more than 400, we lose. It's the old rug barter: start here, start there, and everybody fights over the middle. No matter how many zeros you have, it's the same thing every time. So I always start at a place where I don't mind settling at a little bit less than half, but I don't tell them that. I make it sound like. We fight, 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 fight over the middle ground, and then at the end, maybe I give up a little bit at the very end, ease off and say, OK, you win. We'll go to 360, right? 375, when in fact I had been fully prepared to settle for 350 and condition my client for that all along because I thought that was a good settlement. So we settle at, I say, question mark, 400,000. So garden variety case, and someone says to me, how do you settle the case at 400,000? How did you get that? How did you come to that number? This is basically the logic that I would go through. You can put new numbers in here at any point, but the logic that I run through is the same. You will get lots of pushback from defendants. Some will say, why should we count our fees as part of worst case exposure? Because if we settle, we're not going to go through all the way to trial, right? So that money's not on the table. Or you'll never get your fees, or you'll never get punitives, you never get this, you never get that. So you're always going to have people fighting. But at least you've got now a basis to, to begin to say, right, this is what, what the case is valued at. 
And I'd encourage you to think like this because, you know, the more cases that are brought and the more expensive that discrimination becomes on a garden variety basis, the more of a deterrent there is. It's all, it's all about the wallet, right? If people, it's like the tax laws, you know? If there really are serious fines, people take taxes seriously. If they're not, they don't. And it's the same thing with discrimination. In the end, it's a pocketbook issue. And landlords and property owners and property management companies will train on fair housing if they think they can get hit with a big financial penalty. Um, and they'll do it. If they don't, if they think it's a $10,000 slap on the wrist, they won't pay any attention to it. And that's kind of the way it goes. Um, let me, just, Mark, let me just interrupt and mention one, one other thing. You've got a, a DVD in your packet, and on it are two um, films that we did at the firm. I just want to tell you what they are. They're short. The first one's about 8, 12 minutes, and it's about this case involving Robinson versus uh, the Crimes family. And it's really a fun, uh, interesting, I think, case to, to watch. Um, and what it's about is an interracial couple. He was a professor um, of... Um, chemistry at the University of Georgia, African American, his wife, uh, white, and they actually, they were, they, they were um, uh, denied uh, an ability to buy a house in a, in a very nice housing development in Athens, Georgia, and um, they actually did a self-testing <coughs> where they, they did their own test with family members, and they got it on tape, and they preserved the tapes, and the tapes are <coughs> played in the film, and it's quite remarkable, and then it tells you about what happened in the case. Um, and they're quite an engaging uh, couple. So um, it'd be, I think you'd enjoy seeing that film. But I, I, I show that to you because it's a standard, sort of standard garden variety fair housing case. Hard to believe it happens, you know, in the 2000s. The second film is a little bit longer. It's about 14, 15 minutes, and it's about our coal run case. Lot shot out with a lot of interviews with the plaintiffs out in Coal Run uh, in Zanesville. The, this is the water case. I think it's quite a moving um, story and again remarkable. That case was tried in 2008, if you can believe it, 2008. Um, so take a look at it. I think if you show it, you can just put it on your computer and play it and I think you'll, you'll hopefully enjoy it and hopefully it'll get you jazzed up to, to do these cases. Thank you very much for your attention today and for coming out and go out and do fair housing cases. This really, this is great stuff and I think really important and um, uh, we just need more people like you interested in doing them. So go forth and win. <laughs>